you very much, Eric. Um, of course, it, it's a, a great pleasure to speak at this conference. Um, I'm, I'm very sad that we couldn't uh, meet in person. Um, it's been a while since I've seen Dirk, and I think it would have been uh, tremendous fun. And I think it would have been fun because we could have done some of this. I wonder if you can see, can you see my screen? No, nope, you can't, that's very strange. Uh, okay, let me find a different way. We could have done some of this. So at the risk of embarrassing Dirk, um, this is a photo he sent me um, of um, the, in, in for a New Year's greetings in 2011 of a typical Crimer family um, gathering. Um, there's quite an extraordinary collection of bottles there. It's well worth close inspection. Okay, so now back to mathematics. Um, I should say that, that I, I was, in fact, slightly relieved when the conference was, was delayed, um, I, I'm, I'm sorry to say, because uh, this project um, wasn't finished. And, um, and I thought that when the time came, I'd have made some progress. And of course, nearly a year has passed and I haven't worked on this for a single minute. So this isn't so much Um, it touches on pretty much every single aspect of it touches on work uh, of Dirk's um, of, of the Dirk has done over over the previous uh, few decades. So, so with that said, let's um, let's begin. Um, so I'm going to talk about graph homology. Um, so we're going to take G a connected graph, and I'm going to denote um, the the loop number or also known as the genus of the graph by HG, the standard. The edge, the number of edges is EG. And the degree here um, is something slightly funny. It's, it's the edges minus twice the loops. Okay, so that'll be the degree. Um, so this will be familiar to you as minus the superficial degree of um, divergence. So it's like a superficial degree of convergence. Next, an orientation on a graph will be um, essentially plus or minus a wedge product of symbols corresponding to the edges in the graph. So what that means, it's just an ordering on the edges modulo the action of even permutations. So if you flip two edges, you get the opposite orientation. So that's an oriented graph. Not ori it's not oriented in the, in, the, in the usual sense when you put arrows on the edges. It's, it's an orientation on um, the ordering of the edges. Okay, so the graph complex is defined by taking the, um, the Q vector space spanned by oriented graphs, G comma E, uh, sorry, G comma eta. Um, and we assume that G has no tadpoles, so no uh, self, um, self edges like this. And it has no vertices of degree less than or equal to two. And then you impose some, some very simple relations that um, a graph with the negative, a negative or well, a graph with the negative orientation is the negative of the graph with that orientation. So that's fairly natural. You also impose um, a relation that uh, the G of, of eta is equivalent to the same graph um, where you um, where you permute the edges. Uh, according to an automorphism of the graph. So if a graph has an automorphism, um, it's equivalent to that graph, the, the new graph with the new orientation. So in particular, if um, a graph has an automorphism, which is odd, which induces an odd permutation of the edges, then its class is zero. An equivalence class is, it will be denoted in square brackets. Okay, so then on, um, this vector space of graphs, of oriented graphs, you can define um, the following differential. So this was done by Maxime um, many years ago. Um, and the, the differential of an oriented graph is a sum over all the edges in the graph. And what you do is you contract each edge in the graph and have the uh, induced orientation with the appropriate sign. Um, Okay, so this, this contraction, I use this, this double slash notation. Um, I always use this to mean the contraction where if you contract a tadpole, if you contract a loop, that's zero, that's the empty graph. 
Okay, so you're not allowed to contract um, tadpoles. So this differential is, is well-defined um, and it squares to zero, so it defines a complex. And furthermore, you can check that it has degree minus one with respect to the degree. And I remind you that the degree is edges minus twice the number of loops. Um, great, okay, so here are some examples, which I'm sure you'll, with this audience will find extremely um, straightforward. So here's the differential at the top. Um, so the first remark is that any graph that has a, a doubled edge um, is zero in, in this graph complex GC2. And that's because um, if you take a, a doubled edge here with edges one, two, with the orientation uh, e to one, wedge e to two, sorry, e one, wedge e two, wedge something else, e to all the other edges, then you can flip the edges one and two, and that gives you an isomorphic graph, but it will reverse the orientation. And therefore it's minus itself, and therefore it must vanish. So any graph with a doubled edge vanishes. And by the way, from now on, I'm going to drop the orientations. It's, it's boring to, to keep writing the orientations. Well, that just be implicit from now on. From the previous remark, we get that any graph um, with the property that every edge lies in a triangle, it, 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 not, it uh, automatically has the property that its differential is zero. And that's clear because if you take a triangle and, and contract an edge in a triangle, you get a doubled edge. And as we've just seen, a doubled edge is zero. So graphs built out of triangles are going to have zero differential in the graph complex. And our favorite example is therefore the, the wheels, the wheels with n spokes, and they satisfy, of course, D of the class of the wheel with any orientation, doesn't matter, is zero. Um, now, so here's just, in, just to hammer, the, hammer it home, I'm sure you don't need this. Um, here's another example of a differential in the graph complex. So we're going to contract all the edges in this graph here um, on the left. Um, these, there are two triangles, so contracting them gives zero, as we've already seen. The only edges that will do something when you contract them are the red ones. When you contract the top one, you get this, this gra graph here. When you contract the middle one, you get a wheel with four spokes. And when you contract the bottom one, you get this, this graph here. And the, the first and third graphs cancel out and you're left with a wheel with four spokes. So the wheel with four spokes is exact. But in fact, more is true. The wheels with even numbers of spokes are always zero because they, they have a symmetry um, um, that, that's odd and that forces them to be zero in the graph complex. So only the odd wheels survive. Okay, so graph homology is, um, so HNGC2 is the kernel of this differential modulo the image. And um, the homological degree is this degree, um, edges minus twice number of loops. It's also graded by the genus, the loop number. So we get a bunch of homology groups and they are in turn graded. So what do we know? It's known that the homology um, vanishes in negative degrees um, for positive genus. Um, and it has a lot of extra structure. So the first bit of extra structure, um, and here we, we, we see the first interaction with, with the, the work of, of, of Dirk and, and Anna. And that's that the graph homology has a Lie co-algebra structure. And it's induced by anti-symmetrizing the, the Conchrimer co-product. So that's, I'm sure everybody here knows, has seen this before. You, you take um, the sum of, of a certain class of subgraphs, typically one particle irreducible. And you, on the left of the tensor, you have the subgraph and on the right, you have the quotient graph. And I apologize, there's a typo here, which I can't change. This should be a single slash and not a double slash. Um, I'm sorry, that formula is wrong. The single slash means you just contract the subgraph gamma. Um, even if it contains a loop, it's not zero. So I, I'm sorry, I've used the wrong notation. That should be a single slash. Um, okay. So then Wilbacher showed in, in 2014 um, a, a fantastic result that the, um, the zeroth 
degree homology of the graph complex is due to the grottendieck teichmann lie algebra, which is something that's explicitly defined, but quite tricky to understand. Um, so we don't know much about the grottendieck teichmann lie algebra at all. Um, what we do know is, is something predicted by, by Deligne. Um, so, this, so this was formerly, this used to be called the deligne ihara conjecture, but I was recently told by Ihara that it should be called the Deligne conjecture. Um, so fine. Um, and it states that, um, that the, 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 there's a free Lie algebra with infinitely many, infinitely many generators, sigma three, sigma five, sigma seven, in degrees three, five, seven, every odd degree, which injects into GRT. So that means that GRT is huge, it's got this huge free Lie algebra inside it. And it, you can show, I think Wilbacher showed that the, um, the sigma, um, that these sigmas end up being dual to the odd wheels. So sigma three corresponds to the wheel with uh, three spokes, sigma five, the wheel with five spokes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, the first puzzle here is that, that, that this group is to do with Mativic Galois groups. This, this free Lie algebra is the Lie algebra of a Mativic Galois group. And so we, we can rightfully ask, what on earth have Mativic Galois groups got to do with graph homology? And that, that's the first mystery that I like to come back to. Okay, so here's a picture of graph homology in low degrees. And I'd like to spend um, a little bit of time discussing this. Um, so up the left, the left axis is, is uh, the homological degree, okay, H0, H1, H2. Along the right, along the right axis um, are the number of loops, one loop, two loops, three loops, four loops, and so on. Okay, so you can draw this picture different ways. You can grade by edges, and that, that's actually probably a better thing to do, um, as we'll see. Um, there, there are different ways you can rep represent this. So the first remark um, is that there's, there's this red diagonal line, and this red diagonal line um, is, is, is the line where, um, well, in fact, just immediately below this line are trivalent graphs. So every, every graph has vertex, uh, sorry, every vertex has degree three. So above that, above that, so that means on the red line or above, all these graphs have a two-valent vertex. So there's zero in the graph complex. So your intuition here is as you go up in this diagram, you have um, lots and lots of edges, very few loops. So in, in quantum field theory, that'd be a very con convergent graph. As you go down, you get infrared divergences as you go vertically down in this picture, okay? So very convergent. Anything above this red line is zero. Now going across um, the H zero, that's the only, um, um, degree in which things are really well understood. So Wilbacher showed that this is the grottendieck teichmuller Lie algebra. So here in degree three, we have the wheel with three spokes, and you can show that gives a non-trivial class. Here we have the wheel with five spokes, seven spokes, nine spokes, 11 spokes. Okay, so all these yellow classes are the, the ones that are, that are understood of sorts. Here, the first um, the, the really interesting class here in degree eight um, is G3, five. So it's something whose co-product gives a wheel three and a wheel five. Um, it's, a, it's a complicated linear combination of graphs. It's, you can compute it on a computer, but the, only, the reason we know it exists is unfortunately because of my theorem. Um, likewise with this class at um, 10 loops and 11 loops, there's no one G335. Unfortunately, there isn't a, a, a purely graph theoretic way to get these elements. Um, then there's, um, it's conjectured that H1 is always zero. So this line should always be zero. And the next interesting stuff happens in H3. There's some green classes here and a class in H7. They don't always occur in odd homological degree. There, there's a class um, in H6 up here. We'll see that later on. And, and these green classes are kind of mysterious. So somehow um, the dual of grottendieck teichmuller group, um, many of you will know that this is somehow, um, you can think of this as formal multiple zeta values, modulo products. So symbol satisfying associated relations, modulo products. Um, though, of course, 
we're just doing combinatorics here. There are no numbers anywhere in this picture just yet. The green classes, on the other hand, have no such interpretation. Okay, so I want you to sort of hold this in your mind if, if you can. Good, okay, so another reason why this is very interesting is a recent theorem by Chan, Galatius and Payne in 2018. And they showed that um, how to relate the homology of the graph complex to the cohomology of the moduli space of curves, Mg in genus G. Um, in fact, the graph complex computes the very top weight graded piece of its cohomology. Um, so, so by Deline, the cohomology has a mixed hot structure and the graph complex sees the very top piece, which is point qui to, to, to a trivial motive, in fact. So the, the key thing here is that, that in this equality, from a sort of um, algebraic geometric point of view, the motives on the left are, are trivial. They're just vector spaces. They're just tape motives um, plus the data of a weight. So there's no GRT or anything like that that comes out of this picture. And that's, that's a puzzle. Um, and this wheel with three spokes corresponds to an interesting class in, in M3. Okay, so there are two questions that, that jump out. One is, what, how do we think of these higher degree classes in graph homology, the green ones? And how do we relate um, the graph complex to mixed motives? So if we could relate it to mixed motives, then we would expect to see motivic Galois groups acting. We might be lucky and find um, this motivic Galois group acting, which would explain the appearance of the grothendieck teichmuller group. Um, th this theorem here, unfortunately, doesn't do the job because um, this weight graded piece of Mg is a pure motive. So it, it doesn't do that. So today what I'm going to um, do is I'm going to define a, a notion of differential forms on, um, on a moduli space of metric graphs. Okay, so that's, that's some variant of um, the, the outer space that uh, Karen talked about this morning. So we're going to define it. So I want to do Duram theory on outer space, Duram cohomology. And doing that, using that, I will be able to assign numbers or motives to classes in the um, graph complex. And after explaining that, I will um, explain some conjectures uh, about the meaning of these higher degree uh, homology classes. Okay, so here's a, a battle plan for um, how the talk will proceed. So we're gonna take this graph complex and promote it to a moduli space of metric graphs. A metric graph is a graph where all of its edges have a length. So you can, you can uh, so the contraction of edges has a, has a, a real tangible meaning. You're, you're letting the length go to zero. So there's a space of, of all possible lengths on a graph and that a, a, gives a moduli space of metric graphs. Now you can embed that um, as the real points of an algebraic variety, just a projective space, in fact, and um, doing some shenanigans, some, some compactifications, which, um, which we first learnt um, in, in work of Dirk joint with um, Spencer and Hélène some years ago. So this is a variant of that. You can glue all these algebraic varieties together to form a huge infinite dimensional um, co-simplicial scheme. And on that, you can take the Duram complex. So what does that mean? That, that means that the, the, a differential form will be a, a collection of infinitely many differential forms for every graph. So for every graph, you're going to get a differential form and they are gonna to have to fit together in a nice way that reflects the way you glue um, these metric graphs together. So a differential form is an infinite collection of forms that satisfy some compatibilities. And the problem is, how do we construct such a thing, um, such a differential form? It's not obvious. So the idea here is to um, imitate the Torelli, the Torelli map in algebraic geometry. So there's a, a, a map from the space of metric graphs called the tropical Torelli map to a space of symmetric matrices. Um, and this came up this morning in Karen's talk. So what, on, on the space of symmetric matrices, we know how to construct invariant differential forms. 
So this goes back to work in the 1930s, I think. I think Brower, uh, in, in the book of uh, um, Elman uh, Weil, it's, um, he mentions papers of Brower in 1935. It may go back before that. So we write down invariant differential forms on the space of symmetric matrix, matrices, and then we pull them back to the space of metric graphs, and then we check that they, they satisfy all the properties we need. Okay, so that's the battle plan. So first, metric graphs. Um, so a metric graph um, is, a, is a graph, there'll be a connected graph, plus the data of a length, a positive length, to every edge. So that length is L sub E. And you normalize it so, so, that, so that the total length, the sum over all the edges is one. That means if you fix your graph and you allow all the edges to vary, um, the space of possible metrics is just a simplex. It's just the set L1 up to Ln, positive numbers such that the sum is equal to one. It's just a hyperplane. And the idea is that if you send a length to zero, that's the same thing as, that should topologically correspond to contracting the edge, which is a different graph, of course. So that'll, that'll be a different simplex, a simplex associated to a different graph. Of course, when you contract edge, well, I'll come to that in a minute. So, so here's, here's, a, um, here, here's a picture, right? So let's take this graph here with, um, a sunrise diagram with, with two vertices and, and three edges, has two loops, genus two. The edges have lengths L1, L2, L3. So though, and they are subject to the condition that their sum equals one. So that defines a Euclidean um, triangle, two simplex in Euclidean three space. And it's the open, it's the open triangle, right? It's the interior of this triangle. Now, as let's say, let, let, as um, one of the lengths goes to zero, so that means we travel, I don't know if you can see my, my mouse, but let's travel down to this, let's contract this, this length L2, let that go to zero. So we travel down the simplex and end up on the boundary L2 equals zero. So the boundary is not in the simplex, it was an open simplex, but this is the boundary in its compactification. So now we get a new simplex in Euclidean two space, where L1 plus L3 equals one. And that we identify with the simplex, the space of metric graphs of this type, now with two loops in which the middle edge has been contracted. And now um, it's the space of all possible values of L1 and L3. And we think of that as being a degenerate version of this graph for which the, uh, the, the, the second edge has zero length. So you take all these open simplices and you glue some of them into the boundaries of others. So what you, what you get then is um, this open simplex and the three faces, but you don't get the three corners, okay? The three corners correspond, would correspond to contracting a tadpole, contracting a loop, and we're not allowed to do that. So, so in, in outer space, for example, the, um, the, all, all the, these faces sort of fit together in a stratified way, but you don't have the corners. And that's very important. Um, so I've written here that you, you can assemble all these simplices to, to, to form what I think is called reduced outer space. I'm, I'm not 100% sure on, on the terminology um, here. There's lots of different variants. Um, a caveat here is of course, in outer space, you need marked graphs. Um, the markings actually play very little role here. So I'm, I'm going, to, going to just ignore that. Um, and the next stage then, so that's, uh, th that's a space symmetric graph. Now I want to make it algebraic, it's very easy. We can just identify this, this simplex as the real points in a projective space. So the set of Li uh, positive reals that add up to, to one, we can just view that as, as the positive real coordinate simplex inside projective space. Okay, so here comes an approximate definition. Okay, it's, actually, it's, it's an okay definition, but it's not gonna, it's not gonna be um, what we need actually. But then uh, an algebraic differential form then on the space of metric graphs, um, so a form of degree K will be an infinite collection of algebraic differential forms, omega G for every graph. And it's gonna be a form on this open simplex. 
But when I say it's algebraic, I actually mean it's, it's a form on this bigger projective space that the simplex sits in. Um, and I'm gonna allow it to have poles because we're gonna need that. Um, what we want is for it to, um, to extend, sorry, we want it to be smooth on this, the, the space of metric graphs. So it's smooth on this real Euclidean simplex. Then what we want is that we want it to extend to the boundary and in such a way that on the boundary, it agrees with the differential form corresponding to the contracted graphs um, that, that sit on the boundary. And finally, we want this to be functorial with respect to automorphisms of the graph. So if the graph has an, an automorphism, then the differential form, um, so if you have isomorphic graphs, then, then their differential forms should be um, isomorphic. So here's a picture, um, the same simplex as before. So if we want to, what will a, a differential form look like? Well, it'll be uh, a differential K form here on the interior of the simplex. So that form is indexed by the sunrise graph. And it's a form in the three variables, L1, L2, L3, corresponding to the three edge lengths. Um, and then on each face, we have um, differential forms for each graph. And the property should be that this form, when restricted to the boundary, should line up, should match with the forms corresponding to these quotient graphs. Now, now the, if you look at these three faces, in fact, they all correspond to the same graph. It's just that the edge labelings are different. And therefore, these three forms, in fact, should all be the same. They're just obtained from each other by changes of variables, and that's the third property. Now, the key point here is that it's not obvious to construct such a thing, because if you try to do it inductively, you start with the, the boundary of your simplex, and you, you might have defined something on the boundary, then you need to extend it into the middle of this simplex. And you might be able to do that, but then you need to extend it into the larger cells and so on and so forth infinitely many times. And you've got to do that in a functorial way. So it's not obvious. So the way we'll do this is using the Torelli map. <clears throat> so let me skip that. And um, basically we'll, we'll um, replace the graph with its Laplacian matrix and define an invariant form on matrices. So let me quickly remind you um, of the uh, graph Laplacian. So I take a connected <clears throat> metric graph and um, you, we have a, a, um, the usual, um, usual complex that calculates um, the simplicial homology of a graph. Let's say you have um, Z to the number of edge, to the space of edges, Z to the vertices, and there's a boundary map that to an edge gives you the endpoint minus the source. And the kernel of this map is the homology of the graph. Because the graph is connected, um, the, the co-kernel is, 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 is H0, which I just said. Now, what we do is define an inner product on, on the set of edges. This will be extremely familiar to, to everybody here, I'm sure. You just say that two edge, the inner product of two edges is zero if they're distinct edges, but it's the length of that edge if it's the same edge. The norms, the norms of the edges are the lengths. And that, that's an inner product on this space. It restricts to an inner product on this space, okay, on, on the homology. And that's the graph Laplacian. So um, another way to say it is that, that you, um, um, well, you can just write it in terms of matrices in, in a very um, straightforward way. So that it's probably easiest if I just show an example. Here's the wheel with three spokes. Um, it's, it's got three, three loops. So here's a basis for the loops. You know, this loop one, five, six, this loop two, four, six, and this one three, four, five. You write down this incidence matrix where the rows are indexing all the edges. Um, so, so the loop one, five, six involves edge one, edge five, and edge six, right, with appropriate signs corresponding to choice of orientation. The inner product um, I defined, uh, I mentioned a minute ago, that it gives the length. Um, L i to edge i is just a diagonal matrix in this basis. And the graph Laplacian, you just take this matrix, the incidence matrix transpose times the diagonal times epsilon. And when you do that, you get um, this matrix, 
whose entries are, are the lengths of the edges. And if you think of the, 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 the edge lengths as variables, this is a, a graph, uh, sorry, this is a matrix whose entries are just polynomials, or just linear forms in variables, okay? So this is called the graph Laplacian matrix. It's very, very classical. It depends on a choice of basis. So what we want to do is, is um, construct invariants of this that don't depend on the choice of basis. And as many of you know, you could take the determinant and that would give you the graph polynomial, which comes up all over the place in, in quantum field theory. But that's not good enough, we want forms. So now we turn to this classical theory of invariant forms. Um, so how do we do invariant forms? So this is um, again, very old stuff. I'm just going to take <clears throat> an arbitrary graded commutative differential graded algebra. So this is, you just think of this as, um, in, in, in the examples, it'll just be polynomials in, 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 in some indeterminates and their diff and the, so their k to differentials. So if I take any matrix <clears throat> whose entries are say polynomials, and I, if the matrix is invertible, then you can do the following thing. You can do X inverse DX, <clears throat> excuse me. Now X inverse DX um, is uh, a moral Cartan form. You take, you raise it to the power n, you take its trace, and that produces a form of degree n for every n. Now, very um, elementary properties of the trace shows that this vanishes when n is even. It's um, always closed. It's a closed differential form. It behaves nicely with respect to transposing matrices. So if you transpose a matrix, you get a sign. And that shows in particular that when your matrix is symmetric and our, our, our graph Laplacian matrices are always symmetric, then um, the half of these forms always vanish. And another key property is that it's bi-invariant. So if you multiply by a constant matrix um, on the left or on the right, then the corresponding uh, invariant form is unchanged. That's what's called invariant. Another thing that's quite important is that if X is a K by K matrix, then all these forms vanish once the degree is bigger than twice the size of the matrix. And, and here's a plea. Um, it, you can notice that, that um, um, in fact, more is true. It's not just the trace, but the matrix itself identically vanishes in that range. And if anyone knows a reference for that, please could you let me know. Um, okay, so. The first such form is just the, um, the, the, the logarithmic derivative of the determinant of the matrix, okay? And then we have all these odd forms, three, five, seven, nine, 11, 13. Um, and if X is symmetric, which is our case, the three, seven, 11 vanish, and we're just left with five, nine, and 13, okay? And so these in fact are, give you the um, classes in algebraic K theory, which, um, came up in the last talk, interestingly enough. Okay, here's some examples. So let's take a two by two generic matrix. Then the, the, the beta three X, you take X inverse DX, multiply it by itself three times, take its trace and you get um, this nice differential three form. If you do the same thing with a three by three matrix, you're going to get a big mess. Um, so we have to, <laughs> Assume X is symmetric, otherwise the formula won't fit on, well, it'll fit on a sheet of paper, but it's kind of ugly. If I take X a symmetric matrix, of course, beta three now vanishes, but we get an interesting beta five. And um, here it is. It's some thing over the square of the determinant. And you notice when you do that, you get massive cancellations. Um, and basically you're getting what's called condensation of determinants. So those of you who've been around this subject for a while will recognize that phrase due to um, Dodgson. So here's a theorem that, that, I'll, that I'll prove in, in the write-up of these notes. I, I don't know, I'm sure it, it sort of thing that must be known, but I, I can't find it anywhere. And that's that um, the denominators are much smaller than you expect. So if you take this beta to the odd power, because you've taken an inverse of a matrix and you've raised it, you know, two n plus one times, you expect the determinant to appear two to the n plus one times. 
but actually it only appears with half that um, half that power. And in the case when X is symmetric, it's even more spectacular. You only get one quarter of the power. Now, the reason I say this is because um, we see something very similar in quantum field theory. So if, um, if X is the graph Laplacian, which it will be in a minute, what you're getting is actually, if you write out a formula for this thing, Vita, you're getting what are called sort of Dodgson polynomials in the numerator divided by the graph polynomial to some high power. And you're getting massive, massive cancellations between the numerators and the denominators. And this is exactly what happens in quantum electrodynamics in parametric form, which was formulated by, by, by Dirk and um, worked out in the thesis of Marcel Gold's. So I think that's an interesting connection to quantum field theory. Okay, <clears throat> um, canonical graph forms. So now we apply invariant forms to graphs. We take a, a connected graph um, and uh, take lambda g, the graph Laplacian. As I mentioned before, the determinant is just the, the Kirchhoff graph polynomial. But now we want to define the canonical graph form, not the graph polynomial, is one of these invariant trace forms. So it's the trace of lambda inverse g del d lambda g, where lambda is just the graph Laplacian matrix. And then we can take exterior products of these forms and we get what I call the canonical algebra. So these forms are a function from graphs to forms. To every graph, every such form is a map which to every graph assigns a differential form. So it's an infinite connection of forms, okay? Um, so here's an example for the wheel with three spokes, and you will recognize this. If you take a graph with edges e1 up to en, we, um, we um, typically um, call the edge length alpha now in the physics contents, not L, it'll be alpha. So um, the graph Laplacian is a polynomial, has, has entries which are linear functions of the alphas. Its determinant is a polynomial, it's called the graph polynomial. And um, you can work out this, this first form of degree five, and it gives exactly what many people will recognize as the Feynman integral, Feynman differential form for the wheel with three spokes. Okay, first theorem then is that for any graph, this canonical form is well-defined, doesn't depend on choices. It is closed, it is projective, um, and it has poles only along the graph hypersurface, which is the zero locus of the graph polynomial, which is the vanishing locus of the determinant of the graph Laplacian. Um, it is functorial in G, so if you have an isomorphism of graphs, it induces an isomorphism of these forms, and it's compatible with edge contraction. So if you contract an edge, you get the corresponding canonical form of the quotient graph. So that is exactly what we want to define um, a, a form on outer, on outer space or on um, space of metric graphs. So in fact, the theorem is true for any, any wedge product. You can take any exterior product of these omega-5, omega-9, omega-13, and so on. Um, those of you who know graph homology will be pleased to see that it has nice vanishing properties. So when the, when the graph, ha if you restrict this form to a graph of the right, of the right dimension, whether the graph whose simplex is the right dimension of the same dimension, um, then this form vanishes when it when the graph has a two valent vertex, when it has multiple edges, when it has a tadpole, when it is one vertex reducible. That's exactly what you see in the graph complex. So that's very nice. It has lots and lots of other nice properties that I shall skip. Okay, so now. Um, Armed, now we have a, 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 an infinite family of differential forms on spaces of graphs. So the natural thing to do is to integrate them. So to do this, we, we view the space of metric graphs. Remember this, this simplex, which whose points were the, the sets of possible lengths of edges on a connected graph, sigma g. As I said before, we embed that in the real points of a projective space. So the sigma g here, which is the same triangle we had earlier, it's this, the, 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 the set of points in projective space, alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, in homogeneous coordinates where all the alpha i's are 
positive. I apologize again, I put bigger than or equal to zero. That's a mistake that should just be strictly bigger than zero. I apologize for that. So that's, that's a typo that should be um, strictly bigger than zero because the simplex was the open Euclidean simplex, which is very important. Okay, um, and as, as many of you know, of course, that these forms ha have, have poles along, along the boundary. So there's a whole tricky business here um, that was uh, initially, in, in, the, in the case of Feynman integrals, worked out by Dirk and, and Spencer and Ilan, where you've got to do some blow ups. Um, and there's a whole business that I'm not going to talk about for reasons of time. But many of you know that very well. Okay, so the first theorem is you take any connected graph and any canonical differential form, so this trace of invariant trace of the Laplace matrix. And I, I suppose that I assume that the form is of the right degree to integrate it. So it's a, it's a, a, a K form on a K simplex. So that means the, the number of edges of the graph is one more than the degree of this form. Then you can try to integrate this form over the simplex. And at this point, all the physicists brace them, adopt the brace position and take cover because as we know, Feynman integrals never converge. They are always infinite, pretty much, or in, in all the interesting cases. Um, but this is the opposite, it's always finite. So even if you take a graph with the most horrible subdivergences you can imagine, the integral will always converge. Um, so that's kind of amazing because we don't see that very often in quantum field theory, or ever in fact. And in fact, this integral is a period of phi to the fourth theory because um, this integrand, the differential form, is some numerator, some very complicated numerator, over the graph polynomial, the first semantic polynomial. So it defines some period in phi to the fourth theory. Okay, so here goes, um, I'll just, um, a quick message to the organizers. I, I think I started a bit late. I started 10 minutes late, so I'll take the liberty of talking till 20 past. Sure, sure, yes, okay. please. Is that okay? Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, I'm, I'm nearly done anyway. Okay, so here's some examples. Um, the wheel with three spokes we've already seen. If you compute this canonical form, you get, in fact, 10 times the, um, the, the, the residue um, the, the coefficient of one over epsilon in dim reg um, in, in fight the fourth theory. And so everybody knows that that is six zeta of three. Um, I had that explained to me, first of all, by, by Dirk and David many fond years ago. Um, uh, this, is, this is sort of the cornerstone, the thing that got me interested in, in all of this in the first place. But now it gets interesting. So the wheel with five spokes, um, is not what you think. It's a complicated thing. It's um, the Feynman integral. Some oh, oh my god, geez, it's just some some you know some alpha i d alpha one dot dot dot, and you omit a d alpha. It's just the standard um, projective form. Plus some multiple times alpha one to alpha five is a product of all the edge variables corresponding to the internal spokes. And this integral is not zeta seven, the Feynman period of this graph, which is integral of just this first term. So the Feynman integral is, is just this piece and that would give zeta seven. But this integral gives a multiple of zeta five, it's weight drop. And this coefficient exactly co conspires to cancel out that coefficient of zeta seven and give you a zeta five. So again, this is incredibly reminiscent of quantum electrodynamics where we know that the highest weight parts in the quantum field theory cancel out. So it strongly suggests that quantum electrodynamics or other gauge theories might have some matrix theoretic formulation in, 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 in this spirit. We're with seven spokes. Now it gets seriously hard to compute these, um, these forms. Um, I worked it out. Um, sorry, I didn't, didn't check all the signs. It's something times e to seven. Another class of graphs that we know how to compute are the complete graphs. And you know then that this integral is some multiple of a product of odd zeta values, zeta three, zeta five, zeta two, minus one. The reason you know that is that because this is literally the Borel regulator in algebraic K theory. Um, and 
um, this calculation, the calculation that this integral gives a product of zeta values goes back to Ziegel in a very beautiful paper um, in which he invented the what's called the unfolding technique for which is used across the theory of, of, of modular forms. So it's the unfolding for um, uh, maybe an orthogonal group or, or special linear group. And um, it's the beginning, it's the birth of the whole subject of Tamagawa numbers is in this calculation. So it's, it's, it's great to be, to, to have, we can give a motivic um, interpretation. We can write down a motive associated to this Borel regulator and it fits in this whole graph complex story. Okay, um, Stokes formula. Um, so you can tell what's coming next. If I take a, a canonical form, so actually the canonical forms form a Hopf algebra. Um, don't worry about this in the first approximation. You just need to know that if you took one of these basic forms like omega five or omega nine or omega 13, they're primitive. So delta of omega is just one tensor omega plus omega tensor one, okay? Um, and a lot of terms will simplify in this formula. But in general, it's a Hopf algebra. So, um, and it's the obvious Hopf algebra. So omega three, sorry, omega five wedge omega nine would map to omega five tensor omega nine minus omega nine tensor omega five. Okay. And by applying Stokes' theorem to this compactification of the simplex in this um, blow up of projective spaces um, and using properties of these forms, you show that you get that the, um, that the sum of integrals corresponding to every face of this, um, that the compactified simplex is zero. So that means that the sum of graph integrals for every possible contraction of your graph, plus a bunch of um, products corresponding to sub and quotient graphs. That sum vanishes. So you'll recognize on the right this Conkheimer co coproduct. And the proof is once you've set everything up, it's very straightforward. So we can rewrite this um, Stokes formula by taking this coproduct here and writing it into the trivial part omega tensor one plus one tensor omega plus the reduced coproduct. And when we do that and rearrange this, what we find is that it, the Stokes formula has three terms. It has the first term, which is literally the differential in the graph complex. It has a second term, which is what is sometimes called the second differential in the graph complex, which is the differential where you don't contract edges, but you delete edges. And that's also a differential in the graph complex. And the third term is exactly the reduced coproduct. It's the, the, the co-algebra structure on graph homology induced by the Conkheimer um, coproduct that I mentioned way at the beginning of the talk. So this Stokes formula has a, it gives a, a very nice geometric interpretation of, of all these structures that are built into the graph complex. Some applications. Um, you can use these integrals to detect non-vanishing graph homology classes. That's harder in practice than it, than it, than it looks. But it, in principle, it's possible, and you can do it in some cases. Um, we can associate a motive to any um, graph homology class. So that explains perhaps why we get grottendick teichmuller motivic galois groups appearing in graph complexes. And this third point here I'm a bit embarrassed by, um, but it is actually true that the cosmic Galois group um, acts on the differential forms on outer space. And it sounds like a big joke that I've concocted this. Um, I promise you, I didn't come up with the phrase cosmic Galois group. It, it was due to Cartier, as we learned in the last talk. Um, outer space, it was coined by, by Karen uh, Vogtman. It just happens that these things are in fact very closely related in a meaningful way. By, by this machinery. So here's an example of the Stokes theorem. So let's go very back very quickly to, whoops, to this picture of graph homology. Remember there was this, this class here, which is the first non-trivial sort of Lie bracket or, uh, across G3, 5 and weight eight. And using it, we're going to calculate um, an integral on this class, this green class way up here. And the way we do that is we, we take this, um, this graph here, it was a linear combination of graphs, and we integrate zero over that graph. We apply the Stokes theorem to, to that. And what it does is it will produce, because its co-product is a wheel three and a wheel five, which gave zeta three and zeta five, 
we then do this, this differential D and delta, these, different, these two differentials in the graph complex, and we zigzag our way up to this class. And using Stokes formula, we deduce that the integral of omega five wedge omega nine on, on this class here is in fact zeta three times zeta five. And that proves that this class, this green class is non-vanishing in homology. Um, so, sorry, that was a bit quick, um, but um, here it is. So you, there's this, this class in H3 here, let's call it Xi. You can show that this integral of, a, of omega five wedge omega nine over this class is a non-trivial product of zeta values. Okay, so now we now let's look again at this picture of graph cohomology. So graph homology, I, I've actually switched to graph cohomology because I, I want to dualize because we're talking about forms. So it's, it's, it's easier to relate to graph cohomology, but it, it's the same, it, it's really the same thing. So now I've redrawn the conjectural, semi-conjectural, uh, or anyway, in any case, the, the computer calculations of known classes in graph cohomology, which is just the dual of graph homology. And I've, I've given them names and the names are these, um, differential forms and Lie brackets of these differential forms. So what we have omega five corresponds to the wheel with three spokes, omega nine, the wheel with five spokes, omega 13, the wheel with seven spokes, etc. Then we have wedge products. And the first wedge product is this class in H3. We have a triple wedge product up here in H6 and so on and so forth. And then we have Lie brackets of the original forms. And we also have Lie brackets of the wedge products of these forms. And these classes line up exactly with all the known graph homology classes. So here's a conjecture. Um, I conjecture that the, the free Lie algebra on this canonical algebra of differential forms injects into the graph cohomology. It does it in a funny way. So the grading here is the number of edges, is the degree, and it can corresponds to the number of edges. We have to forget, I don't know, they, they line up in, in funny, Cohomological degrees. I don't know how to predict those. Obvious question one is: Is this map an isomorphism? Um, I, I because um, I can later deny it. I will conjecture here during this talk that it is an isomorphism, but I may um, I may deny that later on. I reserve the right. But anyway, it's a conjecture, but it's a, a weaker conjecture, a more tentative conjecture than the previous one. Um, and I was going to say something about the. The dual, since I'm out of time, I'll, I'll stop and, and leave you with this, this picture so you can, you can, uh, you can contemplate it um, if there are any questions. Um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Francis. This was uh, amazing. Thank you. Um, I, I have a million questions, but uh, if anybody else wants to go first. Um... I'll go first. So the G35 linear combination, which you said was hideous. Do you have a handy? I'd love to know just if it's when, Oh, it's known. I mean, I, I think it's, um, it's written down in, in, in some papers. That, that one's okay. You can compute that one. But I think, um, I think the limits of the computer calculations are, are this column. I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. And I'm, I'm out of date. As I said, um, I got this from, from slides of talks a year ago, I don't know if things have moved on, but I think the, the, the 10 column and everything to the left of it is checked by computer and this column 11 is possibly not. So, so you'll, you'll get your three five graph, but you'll be in a mess when you, if you wanna go much further than that, you, you're gonna to have to give up. I think if you just want to compute the graph, you can take G3, G5 and just compute the graphical Lie bracket. Um, I mean, the non-trivial question is that, it, that this is a non-zero class, so. Yeah, but also, um, so there's a difference when you work in graph homology or graph cohomology. Yeah. So if you work at the graph cohomology, the classes are not wheels, they're wheels plus an, a, a long tail that's not known. Yeah. And, and you've got to take the Lie brackets of those, but you don't yeah. know what they are. We have a question of David. Okay. Yes. Uh, I didn't mind you throwing away half of the wheels. I thought that was quite fun, given that you got back the zeta values uh, decreased. 
Um, but as it's the week of Dirk's birthday, uh, do you have any thoughts about the zigzag diagrams? Those are, after all, the only infinite class of diagrams in quantum field theory of which have a closed formula, which Dirk and I conjectured and you and Oliver proved. Did, 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 that's, a, that's a great question. Actually, um, when I, I, I'm, I'm new to this subject. When I first learned about this at, at a conference uh, um, a, year, a year or so ago, I asked exactly the same question to the experts and they, they said they didn't know. It's a great question. Thank you. Uh, I, I wanted to ask a question about the weights. I mean, you mentioned these weight drops and you had these, I found it quite striking that you had these pure weight uh, evaluations of these wheels with these complicated integrands and you just got a zeta seven or just got a zeta five. So is there like a understanding from the structure of the blow up that you get some bounds on the weights that would predict this? Um, it's not obvious from an algebraic geometry perspective, not that I know of, but I, I kind of have the feeling that all these, these integrals come from this Borel regulator. So you know that um, morally beta five wedge beta nine corresponds to zeta three, zeta five. And so somehow it, what I, I, I would like to be able to do, but I can't do it, is, 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 relate, um, is relate this complete graph using Stokes formula and identities to a wheel three tensor wheel five. Mm. And that would, give, that would give it immediately. Yeah. But I, I don't know how to do that. So I, I, used, I did that argument in the opposite direction to compute the, one of the examples. Thank you very much. Then let's thank Francis again. I'll see no other questions at the moment. Thank you. Um...